starting the session. Hello, everyone. We're here at CrimCon in Stream 2. We are uh, in the last session of the day in, in the stream. And uh, we've got a couple of our presenters uh, who may be in the audience. Let's get Ben promoted up. And Ben, that's on me because I demoted you earlier. Uh, looks like you're in now. How are you, Ben? I'm doing well. I showed up early. I got the time change messed up. So, hey, you know what? It, we've we've all done it. That's for sure. Um, so I'll go through kind of how, how this works um, a little bit. We'll see if we get our, uh, our other presenter uh, in here as well. Each, each uh, panelist will have 10 minutes to, to give their talk and um, they will be able, uh, will be able to take questions as well. Hit the Q&A button down at the bottom and type in your question. We'll get to as many of them as we can. It's looking, looking like one of our panelists is having some connectivity issues. So we're going to go a little bit, maybe. Um, I was going to say we were going to go a little bit out of order, but it looks like Alana may, uh, may be back. Are you with us? Maybe. Not hearing it. OK. Um, <clears throat> So we've got a little bit of connectivity issues with our with our first presenter. Um, certain certainly not uh, her fault. Um, so we're going to go a little bit out of order uh, from the the program. Again, for for attendees, um, hit that Q and A button down at the bottom and ask your questions as they come up. Um, if you are supposed to be on this panel and uh, we don't have you up as a panelist, um, hit the Q and A button and let me know as well. We've got one panelist uh, who so far is missing. Okay, so with, with all that, um, we'll start with the deterrent effect of police on self-reported offending. Uh, so we'll start with you, Rebecca. Okay, great. Um, just give me one second. Sure thing. Oh. Alana's back. Does she want to go or I'll go? Um, let's start with, with you, Rebecca, and then we'll bring in Alana. Okay. Does that work? Yeah, I just for some reason cannot find that. Oh, got it. Okay. <laughs> All right. Can everyone see? We okay. can see and we can hear you. Okay, great. Okay, um, so thank you all for coming, um, especially on the end of the day on Friday. Um, my name is Rebecca Bucci. I am a PhD candidate at Penn State um, on the job market this year. Um, and today I'm talking to you about um, some components of my dissertation work, um, specifically looking at uh, the deterrent effect of police. So I'm evaluating, um, kind of quasi evaluating, you'll see in a second, um, the effect of a hotspots intervention on um, individual uh, offending behavior as well as perceptions of apprehension risk. So um, I'm evaluating a hotspot study. So um, for those that don't know, hotspots policing is um, a type of policing uh, that focuses police uh, efforts, resources, um, and police presence um, in areas with uh, concentrated uh, high crime. So we know this is a highly effective strategy at reducing crime, um, particularly violent crime. Um, we know this from our evidence bases from highly uh, rigorous experimental and quasi-experimental studies. Um, and we know that it's a widely used strategy. Um, about uh, over a decade ago, about 90% of police departments using um, some sort of hotspots policing at some point. So to take a step back, um, we know that it's effective, but why is that the case? Um, so typically uh, you can think of uh, hotspots policing as being effective through deterrence. Um, there are other uh, theoretical frameworks, crime opportunity, um, rational choice, situational um, offending, but today I'm really gonna talk about um, how hotspots policing can be deterrent. Um, and so first 
if you were to think of the way that the criminal justice system can reduce crime, um, you think about uh, ways that we can impact the certainty, the severity, or the swiftness of punishment. Um, and then with that, we're hoping that we can impact individuals' perceptions of those things and ultimately um, lead to a reduction in offending behavior. So when we're talking about policing, we're typically talking about the certainty of punishment. So how can police, um, through say a hotspots intervention, increase um, a person's perception of their certainty of getting caught? So if I were to ask you, you know, scale of one to 10, how likely do you think you'll get caught um, if you go and steal a motor vehicle? Um, and then with that, those people that have higher perceptions are hopefully um, going to do less offending. Be, uh, offending. So on the second half of this um, kind of framework, uh, we know uh, a great deal about how perceptions of apprehension risk are related to self-reported offending. We know um, uh, in the lab and also from um, longitudinal observational studies that people with higher perceptions of apprehension risk are less likely uh, to engage in offending behavior. What we don't know so much about is the way that the criminal justice system or specifically police um, can actually impact one's perceptions of uh, certainty of getting caught. So this has kind of been referred to as, you know, the missing link in deterrence research or an area that's crucial, but we don't um, yet really understand. We don't have evidence that police are impacting this thing. Most of our research is based on, you know, skipping this middle step and looking at policing on um, official crime rates or calls for service but little on the individual level. So ultimately we're not sure of this first pathway and then we're not sure of you know, the full pathway, one, looking at policing on offending behavior, um, as well as looking at this mediating role of perceptions of apprehension risk. So my work seeks to fill this void um, specifically by um, looking at a hotspot intervention and coupling that with individual level data on offending and perceptions of arrest risk. So I use the Pathways to Desistance study, which is a longitudinal study of adolescent offenders, um, individuals 14 to 17 that had previously been adjudicated. Um, there are kids from Philadelphia and Phoenix, but I am focused on the 700 kids um, from Philadelphia at baseline. Um, and I look at two uh, different outcomes for them. So first, their perceptions of apprehension risk, this measure of how likely are you to get caught, um, it's an aggregate score of response to uh, seven different crime types listed here. Um, and for those that have, uh, it goes from zero to 10. So zero being I'm not gonna get caught and 10 being I'm absolutely certain that I'm going to get caught. And then the second outcome um, is a frequency of offending. So this is a count of uh, the number of offenses done out of, uh, for 24 different offenses. So you could do, you know, 100 burglaries, you could do 50 motor vehicle thefts and 50 burglaries, right? These people would have um, scores of 100 offenses um, in my data. And then the predictor is this exposure to a hotspots intervention. So the intervention um, I'm looking at, is called Operation Safe Streets, um, which occurred in Philadelphia. And so uh, in the data, anyone is coded one after they've uh, passed the date of the initiation of um, safe streets. So like I said, uh, Operation Safe Streets, the hotspots intervention, um, character characterized as um, an increase in police presence. So about two uniformed police officers at each of about 250 hotspots throughout the city. Um, uh, this was implemented at full force for about four and a half months um, and then kind of stepped back for the remainder of the year um, at still higher levels than normal, but decreased from this two officers, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, and then for another six months, kind of stepped down from there before ultimately ending around 18 months. Um, and so it's important to recognize that this was a low enforcement strategy um, as opposed to one where it was really focused on increasing arrest. So the goal of the Philadelphia Police Department at the time um, was to increase uh, perceptions of apprehension risk through police presence. So having these uniform officers um, walking the beat, uh, signaling to people that their apprehension risk was higher without necessarily um, increasing the number of people they're arresting. So to identify the effect of the strategy, um, I exploit the fact that the Pathways to Desistance study um, had been ongoing uh, for about 18 months prior to Operation Safe Streets beginning. Um, and with that, I have um, interviews on pre-Safe Streets um, for 612 of my respondents. Of those, um, 206 of them have two interviews prior to the intervention beginning, 143 of three, 
and the remainder have um, six, uh, four interviews prior to the intervention beginning. Um, so with that, and with this data that I have kind of on a rolling basis, um, before, during, and after the intervention, I use um, a first difference design, so similar to um, a fixed effects model, but instead I'm looking at um, the immediate change from a period prior to experiencing the treatment to the change once the um, safe streets began. And you can see on this map, um, this is approximately where the respondents in the sample lived in Philadelphia. Um, unfortunately, I don't know, uh, I can't link where they live uh, to the kids in my sample. So I don't have a true treatment and control per se, um, but it was a citywide intervention. Um, so I make the assumption that everyone in the, the sample experiences safe streets. And you can see this kind of, um, when I show you uh, the location of the respondents and then overlay that with uh, the actual data on where um, the hotspots were in Philadelphia because of safe streets. So you can see that they're pretty close together, um, assuming that people uh, are actually experiencing this treatment. So what do I find? Um, the first thing is that perceptions of arrest risk do appear to actually have been impacted by the strategy. You can see prior to the strategy beginning, so one wave or one interview before would be T minus one, two interviews before um, T minus two, and this is the average response um, for my eight, uh, 700 kids. And you can see that there's a downward trajectory. People's perceptions are decreasing over time. So they're less likely to think they're gonna get caught. Once safe streets begins, this red bar time T, you can see that perceptions are increasing by about 0.7. And then they're staying at these kind of um, higher stable rates over time. This is just a bivariate, um, but I look at this with these first difference models um, just to save space and not present the tables. Um, I find a similar pattern, even when I'm controlling for these within person differences. Um, as well as uh, time varying characteristics like experiencing arrest or offending behavior. So knowing that we impact perceptions of arrest risk, you would think that there should be an impact on offending, um, which is actually what I find. So high rates of frequency of offending, you know, about 100 offenses um, per person in about every six month interval. And then um, once safe streets begins, you can see that that reduces um, by more than half to about 40 offenses, and then kind of climbs back up um, after the intervention kind of uh, slowly tapers out. So for that, um, I've looked at uh, these um, first difference models, but due to the specificity and not having the um, offending data by month yet due to some COVID things, um, I'm going to look at this in the future um, to get more uh, kind of specific models about frequency of offending over time, um, as well as looking at um, crime specific models and varying by crime types, those expected to be impact um, by the intervention or not, uh, as well as some moderation by race um, or personal characteristics like self-control, as well as things like the neighborhood, um, the racial composition, as well as um, the income level of the neighborhood where the respondents are living. So with that, um, thank you very much. And uh, let me know if you have questions or shoot me an email. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Uh, we will move on now to security measures, the criminalization of madness facing social defense from Alana. Can you hear me? I can. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Alana, I'm from Brazil. I'm a master's student in the criminal science program, and my research was developed with the Contemporary Criminology Study Group in the city of Porto Alegre. Uh, Alana, I hate, to, I hate to interrupt here, but are, are you meaning to share your screen or, or not? No, I have to okay. share. Uh, my research is the title Security Measures, the Criminalization of Madness Facing Social Defense. The present research aims to analyze the Penal Institute of Security Measures in Brazil through critical criminology and what is called social or preventive medicine with different discourses on the relationship between crime and madness. The objective was to discuss the criminalization of madness and the psychiatrization of crime, considering that the application of security measure uh, is not only due to the individual's dangerousness, but also to speech that use elements such as race, social class, and social defense, 
considering that dangerousness came to be understood as the degree of probability of a criminal impulse by the agent, that is of a future delinquence as well as for the maintenance of social order, tactics of criminalization of classes considered potentially dangerous, making these practices institutionalized. In Brazil, the security measure is a specialized legal institute for people who have committed a criminal act, but who for biopsychopathological reasons can be held criminally responsible for it. Currently, the basic objective is to provide security to society against possible new acts of violence on the part of those who suffer some time of a psychological disorder. The idea that danger is linked to the madman and consequently that madman is a criminal configures the security measure as an invention created to support the discourse of social defense. The dangerousness came to be understood as the degree of probability of the individual's criminal impulse in order to guarantee the maintenance of social order, strategies of criminalization of classes considered potentially dangerous are used, practices that are institutional, institutionalized. Thus, the crazy offender becomes a doubly stigmatized category when understood not only as having a mental disorder already governed by his own stigmas, but also as a criminal individual who has the instability that hurts in the danger of his actions directly predetermined social expectations. It is at this moment that security measure is configured as an institute that punishes madness. In Brazil, the current social dialogue between judges and legislators on the one hand and psychiatrists and psychologists on, uh, on the other can be perfectly Thomas has. Juristes declare there are two types of criminals. First, the mentally insane, and second, the mentally health. It is up to psychiatrists and psychologists to determine uh, who belongs to which of the groups. It is on the side that was through the discourse of mental illness that social exclusion was justified and authorized. Prisons, uh, asylums, psychiatry, and custody hospitals were the chosen space for the segregation of those offenders of order and social security, which are configured uh, even today as a true place to keep crazy people. Although the current Brazilian legislation already points to a shift from social defense matrix to a human rights matrix, with regard to the practice of assistance to people with mental disorders, it is not what still happens in the criminal treatment of the crazy offender. The new regulations regarding the subjects, sociability, and social integration reside in the speech. In practice, it is not that the historical path of the constitution of the so-called crazy criminal is still based on aspects of resilient treatment protected both by the normative spheres of criminal law and psychiatric medical science. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, next up, we have Porch Pirates examining unattended package theft through crime script analysis. I'll remind our audience that when you've got questions for our panelists, hit the Q&A button down at the bottom and type in your question. We'll get to as many questions as we can at the uh, end of the session here. Uh, please go ahead. All right, thank you so much. And uh, let me make sure I have everything going here. All right, you see that full screen? We do and we can hear you, thank you. All right, so thank you. Welcome everybody for hanging around toward at least the end of the day where I'm at. Uh, I'm glad to have everyone here. So I'll be presenting on behalf of two other uh, contributors to this paper, uh, Melody Hicks, who recently graduated with her uh, master's degree and is seeking a doctoral program. Uh, and actually my wife who served as the statistician and another coder on this project. 
So what is porch piracy? Maybe you've seen it in the news. Maybe you've watched a humorous or not so humorous YouTube video uh, about it. Uh, this was a conversation that kind of came up uh, in my office kind of naturally with some students a few years ago. And that began kind of a search for what is it we're actually talking about? And we came to a dead end almost immediately. And we realized that very few had actually done any research on this. There was not a lot of information basically no information um, about this at all. Uh, but we knew that this was a thing and we wanted to take a look and see what was going on and specifically how we could try and stop it. So everyone, especially in the current situation we're in is becoming more and more familiar with ordering something and having it delivered to your home. And the US is a prime example of a country who allows what we call unattended delivery. So day in and day out, you order something from the internet, it arrives at your house and someone will leave it at your doorstep or near your house, theoretically, or at a mailbox. Uh, and you will come at some point and retrieve it, but it's not something they necessarily hand to you physically or have you sign. And so there's this period of time when a package sits on a porch or in some precarious location, waiting for someone to come by and simply swipe it and walk away. There's lots of different opportunities for theft in the supply chain, going all the way from the manufacturer to the storage and warehouse distribution center, and then once it finally arrives. But we've really focused here on what happens at the very end of that supply chain and at the front door, or what we would call the last mile delivery. So this is a really big and growing problem. When we started this project about two years ago, I don't think we obviously had any idea it would grow to the popularity that it has. We have seen this really take off. And a lot of that is because it's a very low skill crime. We'll talk about that in just a minute. But the volume of packages that are being delivered has absolutely skyrocketed. In fact, just this morning before I got on this presentation, uh, I was listening to a report uh, from China. They had a big shopping uh, kind of like a Black Friday type sale, but it was really just one organization that did it. And in one day, they sold and shipped over a billion packages. And that was just one day of the multi-day sale. So we see this shipping is growing and growing and growing, thereby providing lots of opportunity for theft. The problem is, at least in the US and in most countries I've looked at, no one actually tracks this. What happens is this is just considered a theft if it's reported to the police, which doesn't happen very often. And it's just categorized in the large theft category. And we don't know like we would if it was a vehicle theft or a purse theft or something of that nature. So we basically have no information on it. So as I said, we came to a dead end. So what do criminologists do when we're bored with nothing else to do? Well, we watch YouTube videos. And that's what we decided to do. Seeing as how we knew of at least some videos out there of this act happening, we turned to the internet. Uh, primarily to YouTube and just began searching for porch pirates, porch piracy, package theft, things of this nature. And we started watching these videos to try and discover how this theft was actually occurring. Now that may seem like a pretty simple uh, question and the results were fairly simple, but it's important to understand how a crime is happening if we're actually going to interrupt it. And so we chose to look at this from a crime scripting perspective. And that is one where we look at each stage of a criminal activity, rather than just saying a theft in general, but what are the stages that everyone goes through to actually commit one of these crimes? And so we looked for the stages and the interrupt points. So we identified that there was an approach to the property, there was the actual theft itself, and then there was the exit from the property. So with this in mind, we began to collect variables based on some of the videos that we watched. As I mentioned, we were able to find about two years ago, about 67 videos, there's a whole lot more of them now. Um, and we also looked at intercoder reliability to make sure that we were all measuring the same thing. Each video was coded by at least three people on the team independently, and we compared those things to see how reliable we were. We looked at perpetrator characteristics, characteristics about the location where this occurred. Again, the approach, the theft, and the exit, and some other variables in between, as you can see on the screen. By and large, we were surprised and pleased to have very high uh, intercoder reliability. Uh, overall, we came to substantial agreement across all of the categories. We were very strong on some what would probably be easier characteristics to identify in some ways, and some of the more subjective ones, such as the distance to the roadway, and some other things we didn't have as much agreement on. This was to be expected, given we are independent people looking at a video trying to make determinations about how far a house was from a roadway or the size of a package. But overall, 
we were fairly accurate with our agreement. So let's talk about just some of the key findings. So what we found that was really interesting is that the presence of a homeowner really didn't seem to impact the criminal at all. So one of the things we coded for was, was there a vehicle present in the driveway? As you can clearly see in the video here. And in a lot of the cases, there were vehicles there and indications that someone was home, yet the package theft occurred anyway. And as you can see, this is an example of where someone was interrupted during the package theft. And ultimately, the resident there arrived a purse or something that was in the vehicle. We also noticed a difference that sometimes people would be very slow and methodical about approaching. Sometimes they were quick, but they usually left in a quick manner. So unlike this video, if someone walked very carefully up to a house, they were often to grab the package and leave in a fairly uh, quickly manner. We also noticed that most of the crimes occurred during the day, but this could have been a result of the fact that we're looking at video camera footage, which isn't usually as sharp at night. Of course, generally at night, there aren't as many packages out either, but we can't say which direction this goes. We also noticed some other really unique things about this crime. Uh, in this video, you'll see, and in the next one as well, uh, the use of a U-Haul vehicle. And we weren't really quite sure what's going on here, but that does seem to have been occurring in several of our videos. We also noticed, as you just saw in this video, that there was uh, at least occasionally someone would also steal the mail. So we weren't sure the connection between identity theft, mail theft, and what we are classifying as something different, which is package theft. Either way, we thought the use of some of these unusual vehicles was very interesting, and it really piqued our curiosity in the original paper. We also noticed a lot of groups doing this, and so it was usually more than one person. And in this video, if you watch closely, you'll see that there is someone who serves as either a lookout, or you could call it a getaway driver who trades places, and then someone approaches the house to retrieve the package. Now, very interestingly, in this video, we see they brought a child with them uh, for the theft. There were actually a couple of videos where that occurred. And so what you see is generally someone will either park in front of the house or oftentimes even back into the driveway. And then someone will get out of the passenger side, go up to the house, take the package, move back to the car, and then drive away. And again, as you can see here, we're highlighting that she was running away a little bit quicker. And there's also a vehicle in the driveway which would normally indicate that someone could be home. Two other key factors we noticed was the distance between the house and the roadway were very important. The further back the house, the less thefts that we saw, and the closer to the roadway, the more thefts we saw. Similarly, the size of the package and whether or not it was visible from the roadway were also really key to how often we saw these thefts. We also noticed a few people who used what we termed a dummy package. So this gentleman here, as you can see is bringing what we believed to be a fake package or at least an empty one or something to the house and they would exchange it for a package that was left at the door or perhaps carry both back, both the fake and the real one. We saw other individuals who would wear uh, uniforms of delivery service or had clipboards, thereby giving some indication if someone saw them that they were there for some maybe official purpose. We also didn't find any deterrence effect by fences or gates or anything of that nature that you can see in the video as well. So just a few other findings. Uh, we think that some of the porch pirates followed behind delivery vehicles. This was a little difficult to parse out from the video, but we did see that on occasion. We know again that a lot of people would pull into the driveway, leave a door open, walk up to the front door, steal the package and walk away. And we also wondered, there were some who would kind of look around and we wondered if this might even be a precursor to burglary. This is definitely a question we would like to know in the future. But ultimately we wanted to know where can we intervene? And we came away with some good ideas. If we can remove the target or conceal it, i.e. the package, or control access to a certain area, then these are ways that we can interrupt the approach to a house. If your package is not there, if it's hidden, if the thief can't get to it, it's very unlikely they're going to approach. If they do actually steal it, uh, there's different methods that we can try to do to interrupt that as well. But unfortunately, it's very difficult to actually look at the exit interviews, uh, the exit interventions. So there's not a whole lot we can do once they've got the package and they're on their way out. Situationally, I know this is really probably hard for you to read, Basically, we looked at situational crime prevention and tried to identify what are the ways that we can try to interrupt this. I've mentioned a few already, 
hiding the package, being sure your package is home, requesting delivery drivers to ring the doorbell or notify you that they're there, having your packages delivered on a certain day or time to a neighbor. There's a number of things that can be done to try and prevent this. So I'll conclude there. Ultimately, this was a really interesting experiment. I enjoy looking at new and emerging crime types and coming up with creative ways to study them. If you'd like to read about this paper or any other research I've done on this topic, you can see my website down there at the bottom and I'd be happy to answer your questions or to receive an email from you or to comment on the paper. So thank you very much for having me today. Oh, thank you. I'd like to thank all of our uh, all of our panelists uh, in this session. Um, a very interesting set of, of papers. We do have uh, a question. I think this one is for, for you, Ben. Uh, what about states that have deemed porch piracy a felony? Is there a way to obtain um, data on them um, that way? Yes, this is a very good question. I, I have another forthcoming paper. It's about 90% done. Where we looked at each state's laws uh, for this. Uh, and there are a few that have that either, it's either gone into effect or is pending. And some of them, it's just the level of punishment for the actual crime. So it is possible that we could look at some data that way. In another study that the co-author of this study did for her master's thesis, we looked at people's experiences with porch piracy and their fear of it. And we found that almost no one actually reports it to the police. So even in states where it becomes a felony, let's say it's gonna be very rare to have a reported case and then especially to have it go all the way through to a prosecution. Um, so I think that's a, definitely a direction to go to look at those states, but there's only a few at this point. Um, I'll remind everybody that you can hit the Q&A button down at the bottom and type in a question for, for our panelists. Um, I have a question and it's, it's for you again, uh, Ben. I'm, I'm just curious about um, the, the data source. So the, the videos that you were cutting, they were publicly available, right? So yes, see, seems like there, there's likely to be a whole bunch of this that's not on video or, or um, I, so I, I'm wondering if you have any reason to think there'd be some systematic difference um, between the stuff that gets posted and the stuff that doesn't. Yeah, I think you're right. And I think this is, so when we look at video data analysis, especially of publicly available videos, this needs to be something that's kind of a cautionary tale. So why do all of my videos occur during the day? Likely because that's when the cameras, you know, have the best image and capture. So there's some bias, no doubt that's involved in this. Uh, I would love to find additional videos um, and additional avenues to get into looking at this theft. I would probably never look at this theft again using videos and would try to move on to some better quality data. But uh, I feel like it's very justifiable to use these resources when you have a crime type that's really never been defined. I have a paper should be out in a couple of weeks uh, where we actually define it because it's not been defined and looked at. So this is a great starting point to jump us into future, uh, more rigorous research to really help us fine tune and answer some of those questions. We've got uh, a couple of more questions. It looks like you get to be the one in the hot seat today. Um, questions about uh, other data sources. So could you get data from uh, delivery companies and maybe uh, people are reporting parcels as stolen uh, to the vendor like for Amazon or whatever, even if they don't report it to police. Um, so it seems like there may be data from private companies um, that is theoretically existing, but uh, may not be available to researchers. Yeah, well, hey, Sharon, it's nice to, uh, I guess I don't get to see you, but nice to chat with you. Um, we, we know each other from some other conferences. Uh, this is definitely something I would like to go toward as well. I struggle and I've talked just um, with a few people who are, are mid-level managers in delivery companies and my suspicion they've kind of confirmed, they don't really keep track of this either. So they know that somewhere along the line, there was a loss whether it was because the truck burned or because the delivery person stole it or because it was delivered to the wrong address or someone uh, committed a fraud. In other words, they got the package but then said they didn't or it was actually stolen. That data by most companies is not parsed either. So to look at this, uh, there was a really famous New York Times article that said 90,000 packages a day go missing in New York City. Uh, but when you drill down to that, that's just an estimate, and it includes just misdelivered, delayed by more than three or four days, 
and theft and fraud. And so really picking that out is going to take some attention from some companies who want to address this. My hope is that, well, unfortunately, I think the crime will increase, but my hope is that some companies will pay attention to this and say, let's tackle this by actually specifically gathering the data to see what can be done. Yeah, I mean, and just taking the, the host privilege here of, uh, of, of interjecting, right? It, it, it seems like there would be an interest in them having at least, you know, models for um, like some sort of benchmark. Like if this recipient has lost a certain number of packages, then we need to do something about it because it's impacting our business. I, I do believe that Amazon has some of that built in. I know I've returned things and sometimes they ask for it back and sometimes they just send me a new one. And I think there's some metrics for my behavior as well as the item of the, the price of the item. I do know that there are some organizations who provide scoring metrics to delivery services about whether or not uh, they should believe thefts and how risky a neighborhood is and things like that. But right now, all of that data is proprietarily held and I don't have access to it. But there is some potential for some growth in that area, most certainly. And we have a question for uh, one of our other panelists. Uh, could you discuss more in detail how uh, your research will help fill uh, policy perceptions gap in the deterrence literature? This one is for Rebecca. Sure. Um, very uh, specific theory question. Um, but thanks. I think it's a, an important question. That's actually what I'm hoping to address with my dissertation. So weirdly, um, if this is in your exact area, you probably think that we definitely know this, that, you know, police or other criminal justice systems um, factors can impact perceptions of apprehension risk, but we actually don't. Um, there's only a few studies that have been done at uh, kind of a, a macro level looking at perceptions of the arrest rate. Um, so hopefully um, my dissertation can show that we can impact these perceptions. And actually, uh, if I had more time to get into it, um, I could get into the fact that uh, this intervention, even controlling for arrest, um, individual arrest experiences seems to impact perceptions. So hopefully the, the policy implications of bottom line is that you know this is some evidence to suggest we can increase perceptions um, without actually arresting people, which I think is a, a pretty important policy finding. Um, so hopefully it can speak to theory, um, but also give us some kind of confidence that, you know, perhaps we can kind of tone down uh, the arrests or, you know, more punitive strategies like stop, question, and frisk or zero tolerance or things like that. But all um, preliminary and based on one study and all that, but um, hopefully it's, it's good uh, pointing to future directions as I think some of the other panelist projects are doing as well. Yeah, you know, it's kind of surprisingly deterrence is a, um, a little bit of an understudied um, area, at least as far as how people's perceptions um, impact. I think that that's what makes your work really important. Um, Thanks. It, it's, um, it, it, it's something that we seem to, to keep overlooking because uh, honestly, because I think it's hard. <laughs> I, think it's, I think it's a difficult thing to, to, to measure. Um, do we have any uh, other questions or parting thoughts from our uh, from our panelists as we're winding down here on the day? Well, I would like to to thank our panelists so much for for coming and sharing your work with us. Um, this session, along with all of our sessions here at CrimCon, will be posted to YouTube as quickly as we can get them up. We are uh, working on that after we recover from, <laughs> from hosting the conference here. Uh, we'll get those up as, as soon as we can. You can search YouTube for CrimCon and you'll find us there. You can also subscribe to our mailing list. Uh, scroll down uh, at CrimCon.org just a bit and you'll find where you can subscribe. Uh, we'll let our mailing list know when, uh, when those videos are up too. This is the, the end of, of CrimCon, uh, except for we have a, uh, a happy hour occurring um, you can go to Twitter, you can look us up at CrimCon.org, and uh, there's some uh, information there about, um, uh, about the, the happy hour. And we have a lot of other things planned for the future. Um, we're just starting to think about what, what we're going to do moving forward. Looks like we got one more substantive question for, for our panelists. Were the increased patrols foot patrols or other methods? It's a really good substantive question. Yeah, great question. Um, so it's a pretty old intervention. So uh, based on everything I've read and talked to the police department about, um, it was really intended to be foot patrols. 
um, especially at the beginning for that first like four and a half months. Um, there's no real test of the efficacy of that, whether officers are actually doing that or not. Um, so I don't know. Um, but my gut tells me that the foot patrol would be more effective, especially just if the two officers kind of split up. So um, I'm gonna try to get more info from the Philadelphia Police Department if people were around back then to talk about it. Um, but yeah, no clear conclusion, but it was uh, meant to be foot patrol, but good question. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the late breaking question. Um, and again, thank you uh, to our to our panelists. Uh, that'll do it for uh, for CrimCon here. We we again thank everyone for attending and uh, for for sharing your work. Um, keep up with us on on Twitter or join our mailing list. We'll uh, we'll be in touch soon. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye bye.